Martha Maria Hertog, born in Java in 1937 to Dutch Catholic parents. Thirteen years later, she was to become embroiled in one of the most violent episodes in Singapore's history. The story begins in Java in 1942. The Japanese invaded the Dutch East Indies and took thousands of prisoners. One of the many Dutch soldiers captured was Sergeant Adrianus Hertog. He left behind five children, one of them five-year-old Maria. With her father a prisoner of war, Maria came under the care of Amina Binte Muhammad, an old family friend who took her home to Bandung. Amina claims that Maria was given to her for adoption, but according to Mrs. Hertog, Maria was only meant to be in Amina's care for three or four days. When Maria did not return, Mrs. Hertog went to Bandung to bring her daughter home, but on the way, she was interned by the Japanese. Maria stayed with Amina in Indonesia for five years. In 1947, during the Indonesian War of Independence, they went to Malaya. During this time, Maria was brought up as a Muslim and given the name Nadra. She spoke only Malay. In 1945, the Hertogs were reunited and began a search for their daughter. They returned to Holland, where in 1949, they received news that Maria was in Malaya. They asked the Dutch Consul General in Singapore to help them find their daughter. In April 1950, Amina and Maria came to Singapore to negotiate with the authorities. Amina did not want to part with Maria. On the 22nd of April 1950, the Chief Justice granted the Consul General's application for Maria to be placed in the temporary custody of the Social Welfare Department. This was to prevent Amina from taking Maria out of Singapore. Maria and Amina had not been informed of the court proceedings and were not represented. Two days later, Maria was admitted into the girls' home club centre at York Hill. She's a very nice girl. You know, very... You can talk to her and she will listen. And she will also, you know, try to do her best according to how she felt. But I felt sorry for her at that time because... Not because of any fault of hers, she had to be, you know, put in among strangers. Not her own nationality and not her own religion, the religion she's been brought up with. On the 19th of May, the Chief Justice ruled that Maria had to be returned to her natural parents after a 15-minute hearing. Maria refused to be parted from Amina. She clung to her, crying, Amina is my mother. A few days later, Amina sought legal advice and lodged an appeal. On the 28th of July, the appeal court returned Maria to Amina. Four days later, Maria, now 13, was married under Muslim rights to Manso Adabi, a 22-year-old teacher. But the Hertogs were intent on getting Maria back. On the 13th of November, Mrs. Hertog arrived in Singapore for yet another court hearing. Maria reluctantly met her mother two days later. She told her mother that she was a Muslim and had chosen to stay with her husband. On the 21st of November, the hearing began. Mr. Schoen, lawyer for the Hertogs, claimed that Maria's marriage was a maneuver to prejudice further court proceedings. He also said Maria was not given to Amina, but that Amina had taken her away from the Hertogs. By now, the case had attracted much publicity. On the last day of the hearing, 1,000 people waited outside the High Court to catch a glimpse of Maria. The judge awarded custody of Maria to her Dutch father on the grounds that Mr. Hertog had been a prisoner of war in 1942 and had not been consulted when Maria was given away. The judge also ruled that Maria should be governed by Dutch law. He invalidated Maria's marriage because under Dutch law, marriage for minors under 16 was not allowed. This upset the Muslim community who saw Maria's Muslim marriage as invalid. 
The court did not recognize Maria as a Muslim. In the eyes of the law, she was still a child. Her father, who was responsible for her, was a Christian and would never have consented to her becoming a Muslim. This also angered the Muslims. But Maria did not want to return to her Dutch parents. She wanted to stay in Singapore with her husband in Amina. However, she was taken to the convent of the Good Shepherd in Thompson Road, where she was allowed to see only her mother. Newspaper articles of Maria in the convent appeared almost daily in the press. One picture in particular of um, Maria, um, seen weeping in the convent and being comforted by Christian nuns, was also um, enough to cause people's feelings to be roused. Uh, particularly uh, since um, she had been betrothed to uh, a Muslim. And so, in fact, as the newspapers pointed out, for a Muslim girl to be taken into the protection of a Christian convent was um, a very, very wrong, wrong decision on the part of the colonial authorities. On the 9th of December, a Nadra Action Committee was set up to gather Muslim support for Maria's case. Among its members was Karim Ghani, a Tamil Muslim from India who was also a manager of the Muslim publishing house. Karim Ghani, through his newspapers, whipped up religious feelings among the Muslims. In one issue of Dawn, a weekly newspaper, Ghani was reported to have told a large crowd at the Sultan Mosque that they would have to enter into a holy war as a last resort. On the 11th of December, Amina appealed yet again for custody of Maria. A large crowd gathered outside the hide. The appeal was dismissed after only five minutes. To the Muslims outside, this confirmed their impression that the courts were biased towards the Dutch couple. After the verdict, the angry crowd rioted. Fighting began on the Pada, but soon spread all over the island. The European community lived in fear of attacks by the angry Muslims who sat upon the Europeans and Eurasians they saw on the streets. Some were even dragged out of their cars and beaten. To my astonishment, I saw cars being um, turned on their sides and uh, windows being broken and uh, a great mob of people armed with um, harangues and um, poles and other implements beating up people, um, setting fire to vehicles and uh, my journalistic instincts were uh, certainly and I um, thought to myself, well, this looks like a good news story. As I stepped forward, um, well, the mob charged at me, and I, I ran. Um, some of my colleagues, of course, they weren't so fortunate as me. And the head of the um, Associated Press Bureau uh, in Singapore, a man named Tom Masterson, was very badly beaten up and later died from his injuries. We came up behind a tractor truck and passed it and stopped. And uh, I noticed an elderly person being pushed down from the bus. And he fell into the plane. And he was set upon by some people with sticks and fists, you think, and was beaten, beaten at the point. That old man was amongst the nine killed by the mob. 173 others were injured. Troops had to be called in to control the crowd. Nine rioters were shot by the police and army, bringing the death toll to 18. A 24-hour curfew was imposed to control the violence. The riots went on for three days, but the curfew lasted two weeks. In the following year, a commission of inquiry set up to identify the reasons for the Maria Hertog riots ascribed the first disorders outside the Supreme Court to religious passions whipped up over Maria's case. It found that later outbreaks were racial in nature, directed indiscriminately against Europeans and Eurasians. Another major factor was the publicity given to Maria when she was in the convent. The continued publicity fanned the growing anger amongst local Muslims that they had been treated unfairly. The commission said they considered it regrettable that journalists and photographers were allowed to enter the convent. It also said the decision to put Maria in the convent was tragically ill-advised. 
They sparked the fuse which led to the riots. The government should have removed Maria to a more neutral environment when it realized that the Muslims were unhappy about Maria in a convent. A third reason for the riot was that many of the police rank and file were Malays. The commission found many instances of deliberate inaction by them. Another reason not stated by the commission report was the colonial government's mishandling of the situation, as pointed out by the British press. The Manchester Guardian stated that the government's inability to prevent the riots has been matched by its incompetence in policing them. He could not understand how Maria, a Muslim, came to be placed in a Christian convent. He said that this was a challenge to Islam of the kind which a wise government avoids. The day after the riots started, Maria was sent to Holland by plane. She became a Christian, remarried and had 13 children. But her personal tragedy was not over. Her marriage began to break up. She saw a documentary about her childhood and the riots which had taken her name. She became disturbed. In 1976, she was put on trial for conspiring to murder her husband. For Maria, it was a childhood tragedy which haunted her for the rest of her life. But that tragedy has become a legacy for a nation, a solemn lesson in racial and religious harmony not to be forgotten.